So these are just some uh, photographs of prints that were made, students designed. Again, a lot of creativity going on here. Uh, this one I really liked. Um, we were doing gratitude artwork around Thanksgiving, and the student says, can I, can I sculpt a, like a 3D flower to give to my mom? And uh, we hadn't really brought out the 3D printer at that point of the year, and uh, I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. So uh, it actually came out really well, and he was really happy with it. So these are the things we want in our students. We want them to be engaged. We want them to be curious, motivated, and creative. These are things we hope to foster as art educators. Um, and I think that when we keep the curriculum fresh and relevant by interweaving new techniques uh, into the art classroom, such as uh, digital sculpting and 3D printing, our stu I soon find a different way to connect with the curriculum, a different way of experiencing art. So um, transitioning into um, this, this idea between commercial art and fine art, it's something that I've um, dealt with most of my career because um, while I studied um, art in college, I was a graphic design major. So I studied a lot of traditional uh, you know, drawing, painting, things like that, sculpture. But then I also did a lot of digital media. Um, and so when I went into my first profession was, uh, was being a graphic designer. And um, so there was this sense that, oh, you're a commercial artist versus a fine artist. So I have some very overgeneralized statements that I've heard over the years about this. So for commercial artists, commercial artists, oh, so you use Photoshop as a, uh, on a computer. That's what you do if you're a commercial artist. You, your work is usually used in the business and entertainment industry. Um, and there's this hard line that goes between them. Uh, fine artists, they use pencil, pen, charcoal, paints, and you know other traditional media to create images. Work is shown in galleries and generally has some sort of conceptual meaning. So there's this separation. I, uh, I like this because I keep thinking about, um, I don't know if anybody remembers this video game, it was uh, back in the, I guess, the early 90s, Mortal Kombat, and I keep thinking how the commercial artists and the fine artists are always like, fight, you know, like, am I going to am I gonna uh, beat you with my Photoshop on my laptop, or are you going to beat me with your paint palette? So uh, that's kind of the image that comes to my mind. Um, and yet, I think of the pop artists, I think of Andy Warhol. Um, all that the pop artists did to kind of make art accessible to all of us um, and not just sort of the highbrow, like certain crowd, the pop artists wanted to make it accessible to everyone. And so how, how quickly you forget, I think, because the 1950s wasn't that long ago um, and they did commercial art and fine art mashups. And it was rejected a lot, uh, but now it's recognized as, a, as you know, a real form of art. Um, they blurred the lines. So despite that, despite the pop art movement and, um, and all that has happened since, um, for me, I've experienced this sense that if I work digitally, I'm relegated to being a commercial artist and therefore not seen as an equal to traditional studio art. So we have this sort of divergent path. So you're either a studio artist, a traditional artist, or you're a digital art. And that's a digital artist. And that's a, that's something that's kind of I'm I'm kind of battling with and I've been dealing with. And I think thankfully being at this convention has given me a, a sense that that's really kind of starting to shift as we get into more of the maker um, movement. But I still feel it there. I still feel that. And sometimes when, I'm, when I tell people I teach digital art, they, they again will say, oh, so you teach Photoshop. And for me, uh, Photoshop's just a tool that I use in my classroom. It's not what I teach. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go over, as an example, a traditional sculpture artist manipulates things like clay, mar uh, clay marble, wire, wood, found objects, and many more things to create 3D forms. That's what they do. Digital sculpture artists manipulate a collection of points in 3D space connected by various geometric entities such as triangles, lines, curved surfaces, etc., to create 3D forms. I know that sounds kind of obtuse. Uh, I'll have a little example here for you. So 
He, some of you may recognize this character. He is from, um, he's a, from a Pixar animation short. Uh, his name is Jerry, and a very adorable character who plays chess with himself in a, in a short animation. Um, but I also wanted you to see the kind of the breakdown of what it looks like when um, visual artists are working. They're working with these sort of wireframes, and they have points, and they have connections, they have polygons, they have all these different things. And that is what they are manipulating, rather than um, the materials from the traditional artist standpoint. Um, for those of you that have never really worked in a 3D uh, digital sculpting environment, um, I wanted to show you this as an example. This is a program that I use with my students, and this is actually a, one of the 3D uh, prints that was going around the room and is also up on the front table. But this is what the student sees when they're creating. Um, these are the tools they have, and this is kind of what it looks like. And I wanted you to see that even though this is on a computer screen, this is still a, has a 3D form. It can be turned around from any direction and seen from any side. Sometimes that's a hard concept for people to wrap around, um, just quickly to go back. Some people might think, Jerry, uh, this character is somebody who's been painted and um, done really well, painted, uh, but he's actually been creating the computer in a 3D form. So just so you guys can see that and what that looks like. So my argument is that all sculpture artists, regardless of whatever medium they're using, they manipulate something to create 3D forms. So what I like about that idea is that it takes our, us digital artists and the studio artists and we get to come together rather than take our divergent paths, we converge and come up with something exciting and new and different. Um, so here's the problem though, right? When we um, do digital sculpt, uh, when we create digital sculptures, as long as they're on the screen, on the computer, or even if you print them out like an image of them, they will can remain as uh, 2D images. So even though they have a 3D form, like I just showed you, if we just do like a picture of it, like you see here, these are beautiful examples of uh, 3D sculptures, uh, made in digital sculptures, but they are 2D right now. We're looking at them in a 2D format. So this is where I was really excited about the desktop 3D printer making its way into our classrooms. Um, so when these came out and were more affordable, more practical, um, a lot of people started immediately using them in maker spaces and having students use them for product design, uh, for engineering, uh, which are all great uses of this machine. But for me as an artist, I kept thinking, oh my god, we can finally take these 3D, uh, these digital sculptures we make in the computer and bring them to life. And so for the digital sculptor, the desktop 3D printer allows their work to go from virtual to tangible. So what you can see, I have this one up here actually. This is a student, the left, the left side is the picture of um, sort of the 3D picture, snapshot from the computer of her design. And on the right side is the final 3D printed and then hand painted version. This one I printed, um, she took hers home, so I don't have hers anymore. So I printed a larger one for you. The one that she had was maybe about this tall. And we can talk about that because that's a, that's a difficulty with 3D printing is how, how much time it takes to print them. But this was, um, they had to design a fantasy house. So this was her fantasy house design. So am I suggesting that digital sculpting should replace traditional sculpting? No, not at all. Um, I, am a, I am a huge fan of all things art. Anything I can get my hands on, manipulate. Um, so uh, I'm not saying, yeah, let's all be digital sculptors now and, and 3D print everything. I think it's just another tool. It's another way of creating art. However, I am very intrigued by it. Um, I think it's a new fr frontier in art making. I'm not seeing a lot of art teachers using uh, 3D printers for this purpose. And so I feel like it's a really kind of a new and exciting place we can go um, and experience together. And it makes me wonder what's possible, what's really out there, what can we do? Um, so I wanna share with you a couple of units that I did. Um, I just got the 3D printer that I have uh, about a year ago, actually. And so I had never touched a 3D printer before that. And a um, little, little scary. Um, but it was a really fun learning experience. Um, so what I did was um, for my students who, again, had never experienced this whole 
this whole thing, this idea of digital sculpting and the 3D printing it, I started them out on the very first day of our unit by uh, just working with traditional play, just kind of refreshing their memory. Um, the, the students in our district um, are very fortunate to have our K through eight, um, and so they have definitely used ceramics before or made, made clay uh, sculptures. Um, but I wanted to refresh their memory. So they just kind of, I told them they could make whatever they wanted and um, they could uh, uh, just kind of experience and think about the, what, how they were manipulating the, the clay. And we generated some uh, vocabulary of what they were doing with it. So these are words probably familiar to a lot of you. You know, wedging, pinching, um, folding, pushing. So we just kind of looked at the, uh, what they were doing, the action words they were doing to, to manipulate this, the clay. Oh, sorry, I forgot. So then, the second day of our unit, we had, I said, okay, we're gonna open up this digital sculpting program called Sculptress, and you're gonna make something. And they had never opened this before. They had never used it before. Uh, and so I have a, like a very short video, yeah. Is it just for computers, or does it work on iPads too, Sculptress? Um, that's actually a good question, do you know? There's one, two, three D sculptures. Well, there's a, there's an, I don't know that Sculptress works on, on a computer, but um, I know there's one, two, three D Sculpt, and that's for iPads, and it's a very similar kind of experience. I had a student put together just a very short little video to, sh just to show you what, what it's like working in Sculptress, um, just to, so you can get a sense of it again. So here we are in Sculptress, and I want to start off by making a new type of sphere. I like to turn the symmetry off so we can use the crease tool which you can see kind of makes dents in it and creases into it. And this is the actual inflate tool which makes kind of fills in objects and you can kind of make like bumps on it. And so you have all, the, all those tools to kind of shape this object and make it how you want. And something like Wellframe, which shows you the amount of triangles in each area. And in the bottom left here, it shows the triangles used, which is how a, a spherical object is made out of triangles. And the more you play with it, the more triangles you get, which can make it kind of slow if you have too many. And down here, you can save it and make new spheres and all that you want. That was literally the 60 second introduction to uh, Sculptress. This was something a student who had been working with Sculptress for a while and I asked him to just share a little bit about how he works in that program. Um, this is an image, first day. Uh, I have to say not all of the students were quite this successful in terms of creating something um, on their first day in Sculptress, but I did have uh, this example from a student who created this, um, this sort of, I guess it's kind of like a giraffe head, I would say. So then I asked my students, okay, so after we've done this, we've done the hand, hands-on clay and the digital sculpting, uh, what, what, was, what did you like about it and what was challenging? Um, so they, you know, this is sort of our brainstorm as a class, um, and I have a little bit uh, better formatted list here for you guys. Um, one of the things they loved about digital sculpting was that they didn't run out of clay. <laughs> that ball of clay that you saw in Sculptress will go on forever. So there's no limit to the mass or amount, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, but here's some other pluses and minuses that they talked about. So they love the undo button. I don't know about you guys, but I sure love the undo button. Um, they can also save different versions. So they try something, they're like, I don't know if I like that, maybe I'm just gonna save that one, I'll go back to it later. So they can save a copy, and then they can go back and change it, and then they save another copy. <coughs> A lot of the kids liked that it wasn't messy. Um, they didn't have to clean up. They didn't have to get that that um, sort of dry skin feeling that you get with clay. Um, they also appreciated the fact that it didn't dry out, so they come back to work on it the next day. It wasn't like, oh no, it's drying out. They didn't they didn't wrap it properly, and also that you can work on it anywhere. Um, so if you want to work on your project at home, you want to work on it on the airplane while you go to your European vacation over spring break, like some of our students are doing, they can do that. Um, they also had the ability, as Thomas showed you, the ability to change the look of the material at any time. Um, so you saw he, he changed from that kind of gray, kind of basic clay to that shiny blue uh, ball. And um, I think because of these things, they feel more comfortable experimenting. 
because they know that they can undo things, that they're not going to waste materials. Um, so there's this, this risk taking that goes up with this process. And one of the students aptly told me, gravity does not come into play with your digital sculpture. And we all know, working with clay, that that can be a really challenging thing. Um, some of the minuses, the downsides, students felt. Uh, there were students that felt like they really missed that tactile feel of, of working with real clay. There's definitely something to that. Um, the, uh, it was a steep learning curve. So when you go first go into it, you're like, it just looks like a foreign world, you know. And then um, it doesn't. It's if you, if you're if they're persistent, it doesn't take that long. But there are some kids who kind of just shut off like immediately. Like I don't know what this. Is. I can't. I can't figure this out. Um, so there was a, definitely a steep learning curve for kids. Um, we also we, we had that vocabulary list of like the ways that we manipulate clay. Uh, you know, we had the push and the pull and the squish and all these things. Um, some students found it hard to translate those same techniques uh, that they do with their hands into the computer because the process is very different. You don't, you don't get to manipulate it like this. You have to like use your mouse or a, a tablet. Um, also, this, is, this came up uh, challenging working on a 2D screen with a 3D object. So I couldn't, I mean, you can turn it around in the program, but it's not easy to just twist and turn around and look. Um, and finally, um, technology can be slow. Uh, Thomas mentioned in his video that the more triangles you have um, in a sphere, uh, it creates a very slow, your computer starts getting really slow, and all of a sudden the program can just shut down on you with no warning. Um, and so that results in students losing work. Um, I would say that part of that can be solved by having better working habits, which I try really hard to instill, which is to save frequently. Um, and I, uh, you know, it still happens, they lose their work. It's not unlike when students put something in the kiln and it explodes. They've lost it. You know, it's gone. It can't get. They can't get it back. Um, but then, you know, they can go on and do something else. So it's it's it has similarities in that way. Um, I want to share a couple projects with you that I when I first got the 3D printer, I thought to myself, okay, well, what am I going to do with this? And the first thing that came to my mind was, okay, well, when I taught ceramics, what were some projects that I did? Um, and so one of the projects I did was hybrid animals. Um, they had to choose multiple, you know, different different parts of different animals to create something new. And these are some ceramic projects that uh, that I had students create um, and inspired me for doing the digital version. Um, I was able to get a guest speaker. We live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I was able to get a guest speaker who is a professional um, creature designer um, because we live where there's Pixar, or we live where there's uh, all kinds of visual effects studios. We have ILM, Industrial Lights and Magic. Know, Lucas's company, um, and so um, he gave us a lot to think about in terms of what we should, we should consider in ter um, terms of designing a creature, um, how it would move, uh, the pose would tell like more about the creature, like is it fierce, is it meek, is it that kind of thing, how does it defend itself, is that defense visible somehow in their design, the texture of their, um, of their skin or their fur, feathers, the musculature, um, the backstory. Where does the animal live? Where did it come from? Who are his ancestors? And finally, excuse me, and um, the kind of purplish uh, color up there, reddish. Um, I wrote the word iteration. That was the first time students were in, uh, introduced to this word. Um, but, but design is all about iteration, meaning we revise. And so I compared it to um, revising your writing. So you write a rough draft, and you're like, I'm done. Oh, no way, now I have to go in and make changes. And then, I'm done. Oh, maybe I should make some more changes with feedback. And so that's what's called the iter iterative process, and it's a process that happens in design. So we did a lot of that with this project. So I want to show you, um, I am so sad to say that I did not take photos of the 3D prints that I did with these kids last year. Um, so I don't have the pictures of the 3D prints themselves, but what I do have is the sketches and the, the, um, the digital version of the 3D sculpture that they made, the digital sculpture they made. So I just want to show you a few designs here. Um, and these were all 3D printed. Um, they were small, they were little, and um, the students took them home, which is why I don't have them um, to show you, and I didn't photograph them. I learned, I learned my lesson on that one. Um, so just a few different designs on this project. Really creative, really different things. Some of these little details and pieces 
on a 3D printer, any of you who have ever worked on a 3D printer know, it can be challenging. Um, I didn't know that going in. <laughs> so I went in and I'm like, oh, this is going to be great, the 3D printer, no problem. And then once I figured out how it worked, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a lot to know about this. So um, I was learning a lot as I was going here. Um, I think I have, I'm trying to remember what's next. Oh, I wanted to show this to you. I'll one second. I want to show this to you for people who've never ever seen a 3D printer in action. It's really fascinating. I have a very short clip here just to show you like my 3D printer working. It's very short. So it was a little short. Um, it basically it builds up by layers. So it's kind of like a hot glue gun. You have this plastic material that comes down, it gets into this hot extruder, and it builds up layer by layer, starting from the bottom, and, and it builds like that. So that's how it works, um, that particular type of printer anyway. Uh, the final project for sorry, the final project for this particular unit of study was actually showing their process. So we started with here's my handmade sculpture, here's the first thing I made in sculptress. Uh, here's my drawing of my creature, um, the story, because I had them write a little story about their creature, explaining about their you know backstory, where they came from, the the 3D sculpture the, from the computer, and then that's a photograph of a 3D print. I also have that one here. I printed it large for you guys. Again, this was really tiny. Um, when I actually displayed these posters, because they were this big, I was able to actually display the 3D print on this poster and made like a little like a little shelf on the poster, and I was able to display the 3D print, which was really cool. So this was to show the whole process, not just like, oh, this is, this is my product, but this is how I got here. Because it's not, it wasn't just, it didn't come out overnight, for sure. And um, I'm fortunate to have this student again this year. Um, I had her uh, last year, this is the last year's project, and um, I asked her to reflect on this project and what she would change um, looking at it now and knowing what she knows now. So, uh, again, a short video of her sharing that. Hello, I am Zoe Bombeck, and this is the project I created last year in Sculptress. It is a char deer. It is a cross between a bunny and a deer. But it would probably be about this tall compared to a toadstool. It's actually about two feet tall compared to a five foot tall human. Um, this is my project, and this is the final one that I had printed out with the MakerBot printer. But anyway, this is how it came out. And this here is the reference image. I actually really liked how similar these became, but as you can see, this is a bit fluffier. If I were to change something, I would make it fluffier as one change. Another one would be I would paint it and make its features a little more defined. As you can see here, you can barely see it its mouth because it's so thin. But if I painted it, you'd probably be able to see that a lot easier. Another thing that I was not exactly happy about was the antlers. They were really thin and fuzzy, so I didn't really like that. So I would probably just make the antlers thicker. But yeah, this is my creature. Thank you for watching. Bye! format printing. Her, her antler still had some, some issues. Uh, she had not actually revised. This is the one that she designed last year, but we printed them a lot smaller, and I thought, oh, when it prints larger, it'll be no problem, but there's still some issues with her antler. So she learned something about the design and how the, the 3D printed printer functions. Um, another project that I did, again, drawing on my experience from teaching ceramics, was um, fantasy houses. Uh, so this is a project I did uh, with sixth graders um, at a different school, and I thought, wow, what can we do with this with our 3D printer? This could be really amazing. Um, so I want to show you. Um, first of all, this was the, the photo at the beginning of the, of the slideshow when I talked about motivation. This was the pre-painted 3D village. Um, so they came out white, as you can see that, you can buy a lot of colors for the 3D printer, but um, I like to keep it white because I knew I wanted them to paint them. Um, and so this is before they painted them. I had printed them all out and I loved the variety of designs. Um, so here's an example of the digital sculpture from the computer and then the final 3D print with the painted and this guy is right here. I just thought this was 
so much fun. When I said fantasy house, I never imagined something like this, but it's basically like a house on this creature's back. Um, and just really, really imaginative. Um, what kind of paint? Yeah, what did you paint? What acrylic? That, I was just going to get to that. Thank you for asking. Um, so here's a picture of a student actually uh, in the process of painting hers. And yes, we used acrylic paint to paint these. What I really loved about doing this was we went, we did it, we designed it digitally, 3D printed it. Now we're working in a more traditional medium. We're working with paint. So we're really interweaving the digital and the traditional, and they complement each other really well. Um, the 3D printer does not print in color, not currently. Um, they may be working on that. They have colored um, material you can use, but like I said, because of the way it prints, it's like layer by layer. So the only way you can get color is if you wanted to stop it mid-print and then put a different color, and then you get like a kind of layer, kind of like a candy cane or something like that. So that's not really what we were going for. We wanted, you know, to have the kids create the detail with the paint. So um, they had so much fun with this too. And it's like, you don't get that griping of like, well, this is a digital art class. Do I have to paint? You know, because they were all so just thrilled to bring out the detail of their 3D prints. Um, here's another really creative one. I don't think I have that one here. Um, he was trying to make kind of this burrow, this hobbit hole kind of thing. And uh, this is a student who, um, he is very precise normally. So this was a really challenging thing for him. He was very frustrated by the 3D aspect of it. And, um, but he actually ended up being really happy with the final result. So that was really amazing to see. Here's a one inspired by Minecraft, if you can do that. Um, this one I also have here. Um, this is just a completely unique exploration of the tools and the things that were available in the 3D program. Um, and as you can see, the one she's holding is smaller than her hand. Um, and I thought she did such a beautiful job also painting it. But I just, I just thought this was so, like, I just I was fascinated. It's interesting from all sides. It was just a really fascinating piece. So. Um, I think that's all of them. And then there's, there they all are painted again, um, the village. And as you can see, there's just so many unique designs. It was just, it was lovely. Um, I want to also uh, just kind of go over the fact that I have my students, just like any other art kind of thing, the students are involved in a whole process here. So on this particular process, this is the students with the 3D houses, and they're actually evaluating the houses. Once they were painted, they're evaluating themselves and they're evaluating their peers. And the criteria was developed by the students. I asked them after we had been working with 3D for a while, I asked them, well, what do you think we're really like trying to do here? What are we, what are we looking for? And they helped make that list of criteria that they then evaluated each other on. So it was really, um, it came full circle um, for them. Um, and speaking of process, um, I want to share, I have, I have several students that took my class last year and are taking the class this year. Um, I just wanted to show um, a couple of a little bit more advanced um, student process, processes. Um, so I have just two short videos to show you um, from different students who are in different stages of working on a current uh, 3D sculpture project. Um, and they're in two different spots, so I'm going to show you. Hello and welcome to my first tutorial. Today we will be working on how to build a sculpture. So for your first time building a sculpture, an abstract sculpture, you really want to try to get a few reference photos, like either free-flowing or geometric and symmetric. Personally, for me, I like the free-flowing kind of style. So I've selected this photo, right? Ooh, this one's pretty nice. We'll also save this one. Okay, once you've collected all of your reference photos, I'd say it's time to open ArtRage and start making your reference photo. So let's open ArtRage and uh, let's make some magic. So uh, open references and we're all good. For a third step, you may want to create like a base for your sculpture. Or, in your preference, is it going to be like rooted into the ground like a tree? So let's go back into ArtRage and and let's let's try out a base kind of like this one all right so you see how it like it has a square kind of bottom so i'm just gonna really quickly do this then after this all right this is where you kind of look at what you've chosen as your reference kind of see the style like for mine i like i like this curve up here right so what i might what i might think of doing is um 
as having like, I don't know, my sculpture kind of curve at the top. And then, I don't know, I kind of like this weaving pattern. So I might have something kind of behind it, weave. I really like this project in that once you have a free-flowing style and you have your own style, it, it really, it's, it's up to you. Thank you. I had asked the student to explain his process to someone who maybe had never done it before. And I was kind of blown away, honestly, by his description of the process. It was, I thought, it was really amazing. I have another student who was very resistant to the idea of sketching, which I had asked them to do. So she had a different way of working, and I asked her to share that with us. Most people would start by making a sketch or some kind of draft outside of one box. I personally don't like to work like this. I don't like to set myself into one particular design, and even if I made a reference, I wouldn't use it. Though I did look at different reference images, such as these. When I first started using Mudbox, I began by trying out all the different tools, settings, and presets. And then I settled on the sphere, the sphere and decided it would make a cool beginning to my abstract project. One of the main um, tools I started using was the knife tool. I thought it made a cool design on the um, sphere. After a little bit of playing around, I made this kind of simple sculpture. I started playing around with color and gradient choices. As you can see, it gets lighter in the middle and darker on the outside as it goes around. So this is where I am. I hope this helped. local to uh, our, where our area is where we live and they're very interested in getting their tools to, into schools for free. These are, these are tools that are used by professional level uh, 3D artists um, doing anything from game design to uh, you know, uh, visual effects to uh, animation, things like that. So they, they're trying to get the students, I guess, in a way branded, but honestly these tools are really amazing. Um, so Mudbox is uh, a, a tool that was new to my students this year, but they knew about sculptures from last year. So there's there's um, some differences and there's some likeness, and um, it's a much better program my, in my experience. But uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about what are some potential barriers for teachers. I understand that um, a lot of um, teachers who teach art and have done so for a long time and are very comfortable with a variety of traditional media and maybe technology is not so comfortable for you. Um, I want to talk about that because I know that that's out there, I know that people are thinking about that. So obviously the first barrier would be, uh, my school doesn't have a 3D printer so how am I supposed to do this? Um, that's a great point. <laughs> uh, what, what has come really amazing just kind of just has happened so fast is that you're getting the ability now to buy 3D printers that are under six hundred dollars, um, five to six hundred dollars. So, um, it's, and that's not like I tried out. I'm not necessarily tried all of these out or, or would you know endorse them, but I'm just giving you the idea that there's actually they're not all thousands of dollars. So there's the Solid Doodle, um, and there's the printer bot, which looks very cool. It's very makery looking. Um, and, and the printer bot I've had some experience with, it's actually pretty reliable. It's a, it's, it prints small, it, it can't print this size of, of, of object, but it's, um, I think it's uh, $350, I want to say. Um, so that's one thing. So you can maybe get, like, maybe money, you know, you could get some money from PTA, or you could draw money from different budgets to try to pull together the cash to buy one. Um, the other thing is, another uh, option is crowdfunding. Um, Donors Choose is an organization that is dedicated for specifically for teachers to do crowdfunding. Um, so you can put your project up there and it's not necessarily specific to you know digital art or anything like that. It's for any kind of project you want to do and you need the money and you can get uh, people who would like to donate um, to raise money. It's like Kickstarter but it's for teachers. Um, this is actually how we got our MakerBot that we have. Um, it, we uh, put it up on um, Donors Choose and Autodesk, the company I mentioned earlier, um, was also um, very interested in getting 3D printers into schools in California. And so um, 
they gave probably the, the biggest donation to to get us going with the maker bob but we had several other people jump in and, and give um and to make sure we took it home and so that was that's a really excellent way to raise the the money and another one that i found out about recently is called incited it's another it's similar kind of thing so these are ways to raise money um, another potential potential barrier <coughs> My school doesn't have 3D software, the digital tools that I was talking about. Um, fortunately, there's actually a lot of free and open source software out there. Um, just some examples. Um, one, two, 3D design. Um, Autodesk makes that one as well, but it's free. Um, so is Tinkercad. Tinkercad is based um, on the internet, so you, you don't even download it or install it on your computer. Um, and uh, students have to have an account, but it's free. Um, and then you've got Sculptress, which is the one I was using. That is a free program. It has, it's really great to get into. It's really, um, I think it's a pretty easy tool to, to get into digital sculpting. Um, it has its issues, you know, it is free. Um, it's not fully supported. Um, and then there's something called Blender. And Blender is, um, has a sculpting tool in it, but it also allows you to do what they call hard surface modeling, which is more like your, your cars and your, um, you know, buildings and things like that, it's going to be a better for that kind of modeling because, uh, or sculpting because it's, it's got, it works with like geometric shapes and things like that. And that's how some of my students, they actually, they didn't use Blender, they used 1, 2, 3D design to make their, their fantasy houses because um, it was better for what they wanted to do. So these are all free things and then as I mentioned, I didn't put it on here and I should have, as, as 1, 2, 3D Sculpt, which is available for the iPad. I had a student who has um, um, pretty special needs, and I have him working on an iPad. And I got him one, two, three D sculpt, so he could kind of participate in um, the the same activity the students were doing, but at a more accessible level. And he made a dog um, in like 20 minutes, and he painted it, and it was just amazing. It was amazing. So it was very accessible to the student, and. Um, so that's really cool. Now, final potential barrier here. Um, you might feel like this thinking about the idea of bringing in this technology. I have no idea how to use this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I yes, I have a technical background, and um, so I felt confident that I could figure out how to do the 3D printing. But that being said, I had no idea how to do it when it came in and the kids were like, oh, okay, what are we gonna do? How do we solve this problem? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so basically what I would encourage you to do is to be honest, tell your students that you're learning with them. You don't have to be the expert. That's what I've discovered um, in teaching these new tools. Um, my students and I learn together and we share our knowledge and they kind of, there's this respect that comes from them. It's recognizing you as a learner as well. Um, and I just, on the same note, um, I also provide opportunities for my students to build knowledge and provide, uh, and provide those opportunities for them to teach each other. So some ways they build knowledge, these things that we didn't have when we were kids, um, just this information that they can go find anything they want and all these programs I talked about all have a gazillion YouTube tutorials and there's all kinds of help. Um, and then I give them time in class to share out. So here's an example of my students teaching each other. This one student is teaching other students how to do um, something digital. And this is not something that I taught her how to do at all. She figured this out and then now she's sharing it with the students. So um, that, I think that's a really valuable thing um, as well. So I want you to think about that when, you, when you're walking away going, oh my god, I don't know about this. Um, is that it, it, you really don't have to be the expert, and it, it's, um, I think it's important to model um, learning with, for your students, um, and taking risks, which is what we want them to do. Sorry, I have one more video I forgot. Um, this is a student, and speaking of building knowledge, um, I have another uh, second year student who is working in Mudbox for the first time, had no idea how to use it, didn't get any instruction from me, because I never used it. We have a lot of things to choose from. We have the T-Rex, Sphere, Reptile Plane, Cubable, Car, and Basic Human Head. We start with Human Head. You can click on this over here, this box, and if you pull it, you can change whatever view you want. 
You can also do this by hitting command and a left click. You can scroll in and out with the mouse wheel or you can command right click. Under the sculpt tools there is sculpt which will pull out certain areas on the image. You can change the sculpting strength to make it weaker to make it less bad immediately. But you can also make it bigger. Sorry for all that weird texture I had a stamp on. Pretty much what stamps can do is you take it and it would show up like that. You can click use stamp and it adds texture to the sculptor. Um, just to turn it off you just gotta click off. Um, and if you sculpt and then turn down the size, you can drag it around to see how it's much smoother than before. It's a little bit dark, I don't know if you can see it all too well. Um, but I just started out with the basic human head, and I used the paint tool, I used the sculpt and the grab tool for a lot of it. I did use a knife tool a little bit, and I painted a lot of it to give it an added effect. I, as you can see, I did mess around with things like vines and veins. Um, adding color can help a lot. disclosure that hasn't been printed yet so I have no idea if it will print or how it will print um, but I did want her to share uh, a little bit about that um, I'd like to I would like to leave the time for questions so I'm gonna go real quick just in the end here um, what my question is, is what more can we do with this um, this right here is a print that I created from a material that you can put in the 3d printer called ninja flex it's like this rubbery stretchy material it's so cool um, and I thought what can I do with this that would be like kind of art related? I don't know if I got that one back, so they might have it. Um, I had I printed the word love, and I thought this would be great for printmaking because it's this flexible material. And so um, I, this, this was all a test. I haven't done this with students yet, but it's something I would like to do. Um, and so here's my printmaking materials and uh, some test prints that I did with it. Um, I just think there's a lot of possibilities with this, and I'm excited to try it out with my students. Um, I encourage you to experiment, explore, and play. Um, there's actually an amazing variety of 3D printer filament, which is what they call the stuff that goes through the 3D printer and makes the, the print. Um, you've got wood. Believe it or not, somebody's made it wood. And this particular image is uh, a 3D printed uh, digital sculpture. Um, so they have a ceramic filament that you can actually fire in a kiln. They have uh, carbon fiber. They have a whole variety of plastics with different properties. Um, and then they have that nylon, that stretchy thing. And a lot more. People are coming out with them all the time. It's amazing. It's amazing stuff. Um, so my final thoughts for um, wrapping up the pr presentation is, um, if you've never done this before, I encourage you to start small. You don't have to have an entire classroom doing this. Uh, if you have one computer in your classroom or one iPad, um, and you have maybe a kid who's struggling a lot with um, you know being engaged with a certain type of material or, or you, know, you want to see you know they're like really tacky let's say because I've got some kids who maybe aren't as engaged in other projects but as soon as we start doing 3D um, on digitally they're just like hooked and so if you have one even one student and they download sculpture so they download one two three sculpt um, have them play around with that and then you can um, do some test printing with them. You can help them work with them to actually figure it out. Um, I do recommend taking a risk. As I said, I feel like we're always modeling for our students. We want them to be risk takers, and so should we. Um, and just have fun exploring the interplay between digital and traditional techniques, um, as I, I've shown you a couple different ways. And finally, I say have fun in the brave new world out there. So um, thank you. PLA. PLA. This is um, this is PLA. Uh, it's a plastic, but it's like a it's like an environmentally friendly plastic. Um, and it's a very standard filament that we that comes. And it's very inexpensive. You can buy like five.
five pounds of it for like twenty dollars. So it it lasts a while. Yes. Are you able to remelt them down and use them again? I have no idea. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the filament has to be in a in a very specific form, so we have to form it somehow. So I don't know how that would work. But you might be able to melt it down and do something else with it. Um, yeah. Probably about eight weeks. And how often do you see your students? Um, I see them every day for 45 minutes. So I invest a lot of time with the units that I do. They're very multi-layered. There's a lot of pure critique involved and, and that kind of thing. So it, it could definitely pair down, but I definitely <laughs> I definitely spend a lot of time. I love the whole process. I'm just trying to figure out if I see them maybe twice a week or three times a week, how long that would take. Right. And of course, you could take some of the pieces out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when he used the art range for, what was that, what was he using to draw with? Oh, yeah, excellent question. I didn't cover that. Um, art range is a digital drawing and painting program that we use a lot in my class. And he was using a Wacom tablet. Um, it's like a digital uh, tablet that plugs into the computer and then you have like a stylus that draws. So the kids find it a little awkward at first because they're drawing down here and they're looking at the screen, so it's not what they're used to, but most of them end up loving it because it's much more like drawing than using the mouse. And so, and they do that with the digital sculpting as well. And just to follow up on that, yeah. the sketch that they do on there, do you ever scan it into one of the programs or, or put it into the program? Um, yeah, so some of the programs support images that you can put in the background, and so sometimes they do bring them in and that helps them kind of sculpt. Um, yeah, so yeah, that is definitely possible. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Such a good question. Um, they're very time consuming to print with the current printer that I have. Um, even the little ones that the kids have that I made for them were about mm, 20 minutes each. Um, I, for the big ones that you see up here, a lot of these took hours. Um, the, house, this, the house on the end there that's painted, that's mine. It was an example for the fantasy houses. And uh, that took about seven hours to print. So um, it's not a fast thing. And, and honestly, I sometimes take the printer home over the weekend so that I can print them um, while I'm doing my other stuff. Yeah. So do you have to keep an eye on it, or would it be something you could put on when you were on your way out of there, out, out of work? Um, <laughs> we were talking about that at the beginning with a couple people. Um, I find that, that um, this particular printer I have is pretty temperamental. Um, so it is not something you want to just walk away from because you'll end up with a big string, stringy ball at the end. Um, even the mask piece, the, the, I, I, just, I even brought one in that was a kind of a print fail because it's clogged in the middle and I missed it. So it had like three or four layers where it didn't print any plastic and so the two pieces didn't stick together. Um, but I still thought it was an interesting, I wanted you to see some things students had done with the 3D printer, so that's why I brought it in. And also for you to know that it's, it's not all, oh, this is so perfect, and you know, it's, it, I have plenty of fails, believe me. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. What was the name of the poem again? It's called PLA. Thank you. What mm -hmm. was the nylon? It was called Ninja Flex. Ninja. How much is that a roll for Ninja Flex? Um, gee, I, that is more expensive, and I don't remember, um, I bought it in fall, so I think it was like forty dollars for like kind of a smaller roll. So it's definitely a more expensive material. It only works in the makeup pot, right? No. No, you put it on on the. Uh, you you have to tweak the settings, but you can definitely. Print out the printer box. Yeah. Awesome. I, you can definitely print out any printer, and a lot of times on the internet, there's a lot of um, uh, sort of. People like go, oh, I've got a printer bot, and I've got dialed in these settings for NinjaFlex, and so that's what I did for the, the maker bot. Yeah. Any other questions? You're also welcome to come up and look at my 3D prints. So you had another question, yeah? The um, eco-friendly product that you said you had, or the, um, why is it eco-friendly? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that I know the answer to that. Do you know? Uh, it's made from potatoes. It's like the potato plastic that you see, like utensils that's and things. Cool. So it's photodegradable. Ah, there you go. And it kind of smells good when it prints too. It has this like fragrance, <laughs> where there is ABS plastic, and that's uh, not so friendly to the nose. <laughs> Probably not good for you to breathe in either. Yeah. Uh, do you have a class website, or is there anywhere you'll be posting updated projects with notes? Uh, I do have a class website. It is not updated. Um, I have yes. It's something that I want to do, and um, if you go to our just the school, 
you can get to my, my teacher website. I'm also going to um, upload this presentation. I didn't get to them before the event, but I'd like to get it up um, onto the app so you guys can link to it and look at it again. Um, and of course, you guys are welcome to email me whenever you like. I didn't. I don't know why I didn't put my email up here. Um, um, my email is jfry, like my name, um, at, and I work for the Larkspur Court of the Dare School District, so it's at lcmschools.org. So if anybody wants to email me for questions, support, etc., I'd be happy to, to help you with that. So you're welcome to. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.